so just to kind of like uh, refresh ourselves, I mean, uh, the, the aim of this course is to understand what's changed in uh, the world of kind of um, political manipulation when it comes to um, communication. Uh, some people call that propaganda. Um, and, and more importantly, though, just to remind ourselves where we're headed to, how do we define the good? How do we define what is not propaganda? How do we uh, define and achieve, um, you know, a democratic information space where uh, everybody has equal rights and can speak freely and we come to fantastic uh, democratic decisions um, together as a coherent society? Because um, we don't have a lot of that at the moment. Um, so, you know, in this, the way I'm going to frame this, this, this session, it's, it's, it's actually going to be related to my second book. If our first session was related to, to my first book, this one I'm going to build around the second book. So I don't bore you too much. I assume you've all read the book cover to cover? Yeah, cover to cover. It's okay. I haven't read it cover to cover, not since I wrote it. Um, and I never had to do that in one sitting. Um, so, well, for those of you who don't know, so the book begins with, um, you know, it doesn't begin with Donald Trump or Bolsonaro or, or any, of these, any of these interesting phenomena that we're experiencing today. The book begins with um, um, my father going for a swim off the coast of Odessa in the USSR in the summer of 1978. Um, and he goes for a swim and comes back. He's left his clothes on the beach and he comes back and there's like two men in, in uniform standing over his clothes. Uh, and they take out their, their little cards and they're, um, they're from the KGB. Uh, my father's a Soviet citizen. Uh, he lives in Kiev at the time. He's a sort of aspiring poet. And um, they tell him to get dressed quickly. They're going to take him to the station. He's being detained. Uh, he's in such a rush, or they make him rush so much, he has to pull on his trousers over his wet trunk. On the journey, um, on the journey to, to the place where he would be interrogated, uh, in the car and during the interrogation, he's trying to keep up this sort of dignified facade, but all the time these kind of wet trunks are making him squirm and, and feel this sort of cold, clammy wetness and this damp patch over his trousers. And he kind of realizes they probably did this on purpose, just a little way to kind of mess with his head and uh, undermine him during the interrogation. And, um, you know, he was arrested for you know, what seems now an absurd thing. Uh, he was arrested for handing out copies uh, of Samizdat copies, so self-made copies of books of uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's um, uh, Archipelago Gulag, which was a very important book in the Soviet Union um, that told the truth about the Soviet prison system, labor camps. Uh, books by Vladimir Nabokov, the, the author of Lolita, uh, one called Invitation to Beheading, where a, a man is arrested for a mysterious crime. He doesn't know which one. And um, um, he was being threatened with uh, seven years, I think five years prison and uh, three years internal exile for this heinous crime. Um, you know, they were building a case against him, sort of they'd interrogate him, then let him go home, then bring in all his family, bring all his friends. The idea was that somebody would crack and report on the other, on the other person. Uh, you know, at night, you know, when he was back at home, my father would sort of grab the sort of shortwave radio that he had and kind of like, you know, wiggle and wave the antenna, sort of listen through the fog of Soviet jammers who were jamming the radio to try to listen to BBC or Voice of America trying to find out sort of information about other people's arrests to kind of give him a sense of what was going on in his dissident community and to, um, you know, hope that one day his voice would be heard out there, that, you know, his story would, would, would make it to the international community and would somehow, uh, would somehow, you know, help, help his cause. Um, you know, uh, 
uh, sort of one otter, the next his 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 fellow uh, his fellow friends were were called in. I mean, everybody kind of expected the worst. I think my grandmother told him a a code based on sausages that if he were to get arrested and put in prison, um, if they brought him, uh, if she brought him sausages cut right to left, it meant that his arrest had been, uh, you know, they'd managed to get news of his arrest to Amnesty International and been broadcast on international radio. But if she cut the sausages the other way, it meant that they'd failed. I mean, you'll have to read the book to find out what happened to him and how the story ends. I'm not gonna tell all of it. But the reason my father and my mother's story is in the book and it's kind of structured throughout the book, the whole book is framed around their adventure, um, is, is, is to kind of um, try to, in a very small story, uh, capture the kind of the formula and the, um, the formula and the, um, the axioms, the metaphors that we had for what was meant to be a democratic information space. And they're things that I think we kind of take for granted and assume uh, are normal. Um, freedom of expression. I mean, on the simplest sort of, you know, foundation level, my father was fighting for freedom of expression. Uh, uh, quite simply, against censorship, you know, he wasn't being allowed to read what he wanted. He wasn't being allowed to say what he wanted. Um, uh, you know, Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights, which is the guarantee to receive information and impart information, would have been the kind of the article of human rights that he would have clung on to in his self-defense. And, and, and pluralism, you know, the idea that, you know, he lived in a system where there was only one media, or was all controlled by the state. And, you know, if you think of him listening to his little shortwave radio, trying to get... Um, trying to get news from abroad, information from abroad, you know, it's, it's the thirst for, for, for pluralism. And, and that was meant to be one of the guarantors of a democratic information space. We'd have lots and lots of media. And somehow uh, that would guarantee uh, a more democratic debate, which is kind of backed up by this metaphor, the metaphor of a, of a marketplace of ideas, which is a kind of a, a, a kind of, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know if anyone's really either trying to measure it mathematically or sociologically, but as a kind of idea, it kind of dominated uh, our, you know, our, our, our aspirations, you know, the sense that there would be lots of different information and there'll be some good information, some bad information. But at the end of the day, in a democracy, the best information wins out because of some sort of system of rational choice, I suppose. And... On top of that as well, I do another thing, which is much more subtle. Um, the idea of a free individual. So my, the, the poetry that my father was writing at the time was full of kind of self-expression. It was all about the I. Um, it's very kind of, you know, uh, you know, very impressionistic, all about sort of the experience of the self uh, as they take in the world. And, and that would be a contrast to kind of Soviet official culture and literature and art, which was all about crushing the individual. Uh, where there was no space for the self, uh, which was very top-down and imperialistic and officious and talked into these vague abstractions. Um, and so being individualistic was a rebellion against that, you know, so much of the, uh, so much of the kind of uh, art and culture of the 20th century uh, celebrates that, um, whether it's jazz music or modern art or, or modernist writing, it's all about the celebration of individualism uh, against various types of oppression, uh, whether that's the bureaucracy or the security state in the West or, or more obvious authoritarian systems in the Soviet bloc. So my book is framed around kind of taking those formula, those ideas, which were so axiomatic, and showing how they've been turned upside down today. Um, I'll summarize quickly and then I'll go back to each one as an example. Freedom of expression has now been kind of weaponized by political forces, often authoritarian ones, to take away other people's rights. I'll get, I'll, I'll get onto how in a second. Uh, the idea that the marketplace of ideas is some sort of functional metaphor in a world where um, you can create so much disinformation at the click of a button that uh, it's completely unclear whether the best information will somehow rise to the top. 
pluralism has tipped over into polarization so vicious and so extreme that um, you know social groups find it hard to communicate in any meaningful way, and the public sphere, you know, so beloved of philosophers like um, like like Habermas, where we're meant to come together in some sort of deliberative debate, uh, becomes nigh on Im impossible. Um, and even the idea of the free individual, I think, has been deeply undermined uh, as something emancipatory. Uh, the idea of the expressive individual has been undermined as something emancipatory due to obvious things around uh, commerce, but even more insidious ways around the way technology and propaganda is delivered these days. So that's my kind of brief overview. Let's go, let's drill down on each one of these problems in, in, in order. So I'm going to have some tea in my Russian cup. Um, um, so freedom of expression. I mean, that's probably like, you know, the absolute basis for any kind of idea of a democratic information space. Um, so in my new book, I, 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 one of the places I go to is the Philippines, which um, is a very important place because a lot like the Soviet Union, it had a, a kind of a, a dictatorial regime during the Cold War. Unlike the Soviet Union, this was one of the ones that, that we backed, so America backed it. Um, but, 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 you know, if my parents had ended up in the Philippines, they would have found it quite recognizable. You know, there was a secret police who used censorship uh, to quash any dissidents' disagreements, um, who would, uh, there was a, uh, a dissident press, a sort of an illegal press, uh, where people would try to publish their own, uh, their own material, um, called the Mosquito Press, just like my father would have been involved with in the Soviet Union, which was constantly being chased and shut down by, by the government, by the Marcos regime. In, in 1986, the kind of the military dictatorship is overthrown in scenes and in rhetoric, which is very similar to what we hear in 1989 in Eastern Europe, all about a celebration of rights, uh, a, a desire for pluralism, for representation, and just the whole narrative of freedom um, in these massive street demonstrations in 1986. Um, uh, you could actually say that sort of the wave of democratization that then kind of sweeps through uh, um, Eastern Europe and a lot of South Asia, parts of Latin America, kind of starts uh, not in not in Prague or, or in or in Dresden or in Berlin, but in Manila. Um, so the time I got to Manila, which was a couple of years ago, um, there was a new president in uh, called Rodrigo Duterte, who um, was doing something very strange. He was he was actually rehabilitating Marcos, the old military dictator. He has reburied him as a, uh, as a hero. Um, and he was creating a new type of very aggressive, authoritarian leaning um, governance. But it was nothing like the old one. There was no secret police coming around and arresting you. There wasn't really very much censorship in the way that we used to know it. I mean, now, since then, some has appeared, but something else was going on. So when I would meet um, critical journalists there or political opposition members, um, the way it would work would be, you know, they'd wake up in the morning after they'd done a story critical of the government and its habit of extrajudicial killings, and they'd suddenly find that they were being attacked online. These kind of swarms of, uh, e uh, of emails, Twitter posts, Facebook posts, in a kind of deluge, uh, attacking them for being fake news, for being unpatriotic, um, sort of like attacking them verbally uh, with unpleasant visual memes, um, attacking how they looked, uh, most of all attacking their credibility, but not in language that's illegal. You know, we do have illegal language, sort of, you know, hardcore death threats are illegal, but all this language was legal, you know, but these kind of like massive attacks on them, um, which would begin to influence their advertising revenue, would begin to make people turn against them, would just destroy their reputation and their sort of sense of community and trust that they developed. And after a while, you know, they began searching 
more into these various, uh, uh, you know, various accounts. And then they started noticing, you know, they were very strange. It was like the same words were being used over and over and over. Um, and uh, so they're like, well, maybe this isn't entirely organic. Maybe, maybe these aren't real people. But then they began to look and the accounts did look like real people. They had uh, biographies and places where they worked. So they went a bit further, started calling up, you know, the places where some of the kind of like internet, uh, some of the most active internet accounts claim to be working. And, and the people there would say, no, no, we've never heard of these people. These are, these are made up names. And after a while, they realized this wasn't actually an organic thing. This was some sort of orchestrated campaign. These were cyber militias and online mobs and what we now call troll factories being targeted against them. And by that time, things were getting pretty bad in the sense that, you know, the start of these campaigns had been to discredit them, undermine faith of them, intimidate them. And now they're actually, you know, once that faith in them had been broken, they were finding quite a lot of, you know, legal measures were being taken against them as well. Old tax cases were being raised. But all these things would only have been possible, these legal messages, because of the campaign before that. And when they would start to scream saying, look, this is actually a form of oppression. This is a form, weirdly, of censorship through noise. The government spokespeople would say, no, this is freedom of expression. This is what you critical journalists and democratic activists wanted. You know, this is freedom of expression. This is more speech. You know, this is what you always said. You always said more speech would be good for democracy. Um, whether some of these are bots, whether some of these are uh, cyber militias, whether some of these are genuine people is not the point. And even though these messages are very, um, you know, there's a good deal of cynicism in them, um, they have a point. There is nothing in Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights, which is the declaration that supports freedom of expression about disinformation or troll armies or bots. There's just the right to receive and impart information and that's it. So there was no kind of philosophical, let alone legal, measure that my friends in the Philippines could take. And look, these kinds of techniques are used everywhere in democracies and non-democracies. We all know about the uh, uh, infamous Russian troll factory, but there's barely a country now where some form of cyber militia isn't employed by political actors, both in democracies and in authoritarian regimes. The relationship can be different. Uh, sometimes it's just incentivizing mobs online to go after someone, which we've seen happen in America. One of the reasons that Freedom House has lowered America's uh, media freedom rating over the last couple of years. But um, at other times, it's using, you know, PR companies to do it. Other times, it's uh, motivating youth groups uh, to do it. So, so there's lots of ways to do it, but the technology of actually then executing it is fairly consistent. So, so much for freedom of expression as a guarantee of, uh, as a guarantee of, of, of rights. Um, you know, pluralism. I mean, you guys are in America. So, so, you know, whenever I start talking about how pluralism has tipped into polarization, um, I think, you know, the American example is so, is so vivid and so obvious. I don't really feel the need to, to kind of lecture you about it. What I would say is it's one that we see everywhere. Um, even in countries where there's authoritarian control, uh, or even authoritarians understand they usually can't control the whole of the information space in a, in a hegemonic way that they uh, used to in the, uh, you know, when there were two TV channels and five newspapers. So even someone like Russia, Putin will control most of the information space, but there's much less censorship than there was in the Soviet times. Uh, you can easily, unlike my father trying to listen in to Radio Free Europe or, or the BBC, you can easily access the BBC or Radio Free Europe. There's absolutely, you can't do it on TV, but on the internet you can very easily. And so what regimes like this and what you see inside democracies have, you know, realize what they need to do instead is, is what one Russian media analyst called Vasily Gartov, who's now at, in the US at Annenberg, calls white jamming. The creation of so much, so many psychological blocks that you don't want to listen to the other side. 
And of course, the, you know, the rhetorical device that we see used over and over again in order to implement this is conspiratorial thinking as a way to seal an identity. I know we talked a little bit about it last week as well in terms of information war. That's, did we talk about the Russian theory of information war last week? That's one example of a conspiratorial mode of thinking. But whether it's Vucic in Serbia or Erdogan in Turkey, or, you know, I'll leave you, I'll let your imaginations and associations roam free about what's going on in the US. The, you know, the advantage of conspiratorial thinking um, is that, you know, it seals in identity, it creates an us and them. It's a, it's a, it's a binding force that can help create uh, a sense of uh, a sense of community. Um, it makes you deeply cynical about any kind of information you might hear. So that you know the favorite message of all these all these political actors is everything is propaganda. Everything you hear out there is propaganda. Everything is manipulation. All criticisms of me that's manipulation as well. Um, it's a very profitable uh, type of messaging for a political leader. Um, it eats away at trust. Most of all, it makes people feel helpless. If you live in a world of endless dark conspiracies and there's nothing you can change as a, as an individual. Um, and therefore you need a strong leader to guide you through the murk from all these enemies that surround you. And also I think gives probably a lot of advantages to the people who are listening to it because apart from giving you a sense of community in a world where identities have gone astray, at the end of the day, it makes you feel good about yourself. All your mistakes, all the things that you didn't manage to achieve in life, they're not your fault. It's all the fault of the global conspiracy. And this kind of conspiratorial thinking has become a mainstay of, of so many political movements and political leaders. Um, so there, then that's not one that really needs to shut down pluralism. Quite the opposite. It kind of like, you know, you get to kind of define all the other media as being the enemy media while we're here inside our happy echo chamber. Um, but the great damage being, of course, that it breaks down any hope for any kind of deliberative debate. If the other side is a malign information war force that only puts out propaganda, then uh, there's no way we can enter into any kind of you know, deliberative debate about policy changes or something. All we can do is defend ourselves from the other side. Um, you know, conspiracy theories as a way of sealing in identity uh, is, a very, is, a very powerful, is a very powerful tool. I think one more thing that's worth noting in that is, is kind of the attack on there being the possibility of any kind of impartiality or objectivity. I mean, this is a, you know, I think we talked about it a little bit last time as well, but in the famous words of Dmitry Kisilov, the, the, you know, Russia's most popular current affairs presenter and the head of the Russian state news agency, there is no such thing as objectivity. It's a myth imposed upon us, which is something that he told his own journalists when they started complaining about the amount of lies that they were having to tell. He was like, well, objectivity. There's no difference between a lie and a truth. Everything we see out there is information war and propaganda, therefore we've got to fight back. It's the, exactly the same arguments that you hear Sean Hannity making in the US when he argues that uh, everyone is corrupt, uh, that there is no such thing as impartiality, and therefore, not that we should strive for impartiality, therefore all that's left is hyper-emotionalism and a radical subjectivity. I mean, the irony is of course that they're kind of misquoting and purposefully perverting um, kind of, you know, ideas from the 60s and 70s that fought for uh, genuine pluralism and, you know, fought for various types of more inclusive debate. Um, you know, it's, you know, uh, male, you know, what you call objectivity is just male subjectivity was one of the great kind of rallying cries of the feminist movement. There it was being used for greater rights. Here the same arguments are being used to create a discourse where no rights can exist because even rights are just, you know, uh, cast as, as a form of manipulation. Um, so the sort of the ground is laid, is laid bare and wasted for any kind of interaction. 
And then even, I think, more on, on a very insidious level, um, the idea of an emancipated uh, free self that was so important to our 20th century concepts of, uh, of democracy and a democratic information space have been undermined. I mean, you know, I mentioned that my father was a poet, wrote in this very sort of expressive um, uh, way um, that was meant to be a way of fighting power. Okay? Power wanted to crush the individual. So, you know, the emancipatory thing was to be as freedom loving as, as possible. I mean, today, any one of us can go and be a modernist poet on, on Facebook. Um, a lot of, you know, you could, you know, there is, there is a trace of, of, you know, Ezra Pound, I'd say, in, in much of Donald Trump's writing. Um, but each one of us, because definitely Sylvia Plath and often, often thinks of themselves as some great uh, expressive modernist poet on, on Facebook, um, pouring out their emotion, pouring out themselves. What does Facebook ask you in the morning? You know, what's in your mind? You know, all these virtues of, 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 uh, of democratic discourse from the 20th century. But of course, the catch is the more you reveal about yourself, the more you tell about yourself, the more you articulate about yourself, the more um, your information is turned into data, which is then given to, you know, in the most obvious case, advertisers, in the worst case, political propagandists, who can then use that information, that data to target you with political campaigns, which um, A, you're often not even aware of because they're not clearly marked. You don't know who's behind them. You don't know who's delivered them. You don't know which of your own data has been used to target you. But most importantly, their aim is not to crush you with a worldview, like with the regimes and the propaganda of the 20th century, but quite the opposite, to understand you so well that they can build a campaign around you, yeah? So that link between free speech, emancipation, and self-expression, uh, and political freedom has been deeply, deeply undermined. And that's even led to, you know, a slightly different type of, of campaigning. Um, we talked a, bit, a, lot about, a little bit about it last week already, and I think we talked a bit about the similarity between the Brexit campaign and 1990s campaigns in Russia. Yeah, I think we talked about that last week, yeah? about Pavlovsky, yeah, yeah, we did that. But I mean, it's, it's the same everywhere you go. Uh, I'm talking to spin doctors in, in, um, uh, in Latin America and Mexico, uh, or on the left. Uh, I think if, if you look at thinkers like Chantal Mouffe, who is one of the lead proponents of what she calls left populism, or if you think about um, people involved in his with Tahir, which later kind of morphed through many, 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 many stages um, and with different people into ISIS, the idea of creating political Islam, all of them kind of move from the idea that the old identities have fallen apart, old social classes have fallen apart, old social identities have fallen apart. And now what your aim is, is to find out, you know, very precisely the different desires and cognitive biases of different social groups or even different people and to pull them in, depending on what they want already, into one clump of the people, the Umar, um, you know, whichever generic category you want to use. But it's always this idea of connecting people's emotions, their frustrated desires, often, uh, often their private frustrated desires, with, um, you know, the Umar or, um, you know, or or Kirchner, or any one of these openly populist leaders being the solution to these various very, very discreet frustrations. And in a social media era, you can do that with a hell of a lot of uh, precision and understanding. So things have been turned a little bit upside down. Uh, those building blocks, which were meant to safeguard us from manipulation, which were meant to safeguard us from power, have now been turned against us. So what do we do? Um, we'll be talking a lot more about that next week. What do we do? Um, but I think I want to start the discussion now and then maybe we'll, we'll kind of continue that um, even more detail next week. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm very old fashioned. I'm, um, I'm still a great believer in these kind of like fraying, um, 
hollowed out um, values of, of, of human rights and, and kind of an ideal of democracy based on some kind of, uh, you know, full free and fair debate between people who know what they're talking about and want to listen to each other and are ready to progress together. Um, so I'm not going to jettison them right away. You know, a lot of people will say it's over, you know, it's all over. Uh, it was a nice little hiccup in history, but you know, we're just into, or back into different types of great power, competition and mob rule. That's just where we are now. I'm not ready to give up on it yet. So I keep on thinking, how can we take those values, which people were ready to sacrifice themselves for in the 20th century, fought so much. It was such an effort to get the Declaration of Human Rights banged on the wall of the UN. Um, how do we make sense of them today? What do they mean today? So let's take freedom of expression. One of the ways democracies, and I know this isn't true in America because America's unique, but in Europe, democracies have tried to respond to this new context of just these kind of deluge of disinformation and troll farms and cyber militias is to try and control content. So whether it's in Germany or in Britain with the new proposed laws, everyone's trying to come up with a way to find a way to define disinformation. And if we can define disinformation, then we can regulate against it. And we've come up, for example, in Britain with a completely absurd idea called legal but harmful speech, which will be punished. So it's legal because we can't say it's calling somebody fake news is illegal, but it's harmful in a way we can't quite define. So we're going to try to regulate it. Human rights groups are up in arms. European Court of Human Rights is just saying the moment any of these cases come to us, we're throwing this out. There is no legal concept of disinformation. Something is going wrong if good natured politicians in order to save democracy are alienating the court of human rights and human rights groups. Yeah. There is something, something is very strange if we're having to trample on the ideals of democracy to save democracy. But can we think of disinformation in another way? So let's go back to the example of the, of the Philippines and these attacks on journalists there, or let us take the, Russian campaign in the US, this infamous Russian campaign in the US, um, which, you know, in terms of its methodology is really no different to any domestic campaign where you create a bunch of sock puppet accounts and push your message. What is the disinforming bit there? The content is often neutral. It's emotionally abusive, but a lot of the time it's saying, you know, Trump good, Clinton bad. These guys are fake news. I mean, these are that you know these are meaning meaningless statements in terms of information or disinformation their deception lies in something else the disinforming bit is not in the content it's not the content that we should be thinking about there's always been lies and bullshit and nasty stuff in the media we never bothered about it before what's new is the way these statements can be blown up with artificial amplification, which online is so easy to do. Um, you know, the problem isn't one person saying you're fake news. The problem is the creation in a moment of thousands of fake inauthentic accounts, which in a coordinated way are pushing this message. That's the deceptive bit. So the audience, thinks they're listening to, no, to people saying what they think, but it's not people. It's completely artificial. I'm not talking about anonymity. Anonymity is a right for a person. You're allowed to be anonymous online, that's fine. I'm talking about these kind of mass online manipulations. That is a form of deception I think we can regulate against. You know, that's got nothing to do with freedom of expression. And that's got to do with fraud, essentially. So where it's a form of consumer fraud. We can think about regulation around that. And we can think about it on the basis of freedom of expression. Because it's the desire for you, the citizen online, to understand your information environment. That perhaps is the great paradox that we live in. 
we have more information than ever before. We live in an era of information abundance, but we have less information than ever before about how the information environment is shaped. Yeah. We don't understand if something online is a real person or an army of bots. We don't understand if, um, you know, we don't understand who is behind uh, information that's been targeted at us and uh, how much money they spent to target at us, why they're sending it at us, if they're showing our neighbor the same thing. We're like, I don't know. We're like, I don't know if you remember the Tempest, the Shakespeare play. We're like Prospero, who's this kind of like a, this poor uh, man beast that lives on an island controlled by a wizard who's constantly changing the weather and the sounds and the noises around Caliban, who's the, the, his poor victim. And we're like Caliban on Prospero's island, completely not understanding about how the information environment around us is created. Look, when the Trump campaign says Google pushes conservative news down and liberal news up, we don't know. It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but we don't know. <laughs> we really don't. Until there's algorithmic transparency, until we live in an information environment that's transparent, we can't know. And we're going to live in a world of chaos where conspiracy theories are rife, where we feel lost, where we do turn to strong men or strong women leaders to lead us through this murky world. So if we were to think of freedom of expression around that, because you know, freedom of expression as expressed in Article 19, is the right to receive information as well. Then I still think we're on democratic grounds. We don't have to start censoring. We're asking for more information. And look, this is exactly the sort of thing that the Xi Jinping's or the Putin's of this world don't want. They don't want their populations knowing how they're manipulating their own internet, how their own data is being used, how um, they're gaming the search engine optimization of their, of their own societies in order to put their own news top. So that's the regulatory bit. So I do think we can regulate this space in a way that's consistent with democratic values and that would at least make it transparent enough to try to, for those who want to foster some sort of democratic debate, to have a chance to respond. And that's all regulation can ever do in a democracy. All we can do is create a more level playing field. If people still choose to be Nazis, they're still gonna to choose to be Nazis. But it'd be nice to know who's making them want to be Nazis and, and start to think how we can reach out to them. Those of them who wanna be reached out to. And that's the next stage. We need to rethink the role of, I'm gonna call it public service spirited media. So I don't have it in front of me. I was gonna read you a quote from Lord Reith, the founder of the BBC. I've just finished a big essay about him. So it's very interesting. This is the guy who created the BBC. So in the 1920s in Britain, um, very similar landscape to now. Radio has appeared after a kind of like a, a very romantic period of people thinking that radio will unite people across borders, it will end all wars, it will bring true democracy very quickly. Radio had been kind of seized by dictatorships, was being used for, um, at best, um, rapacious commercial gain, but at worst, kind of totalitarian dictatorships. Uh, the English media landscape was in a polarized mess. And basically, the BBC is created after many fights with the idea that we need some sort of space where we all come together and practice democracy, where we talk to each other. An agora in the ancient Athenian idea, an arena in the, in the kind of much less democratic Roman idea, but a place for a public sphere. And the role of public service media wasn't just this kind of PBS idea, oh, we'll do the real boring stuff which nobody else is doing. No, the role of public service media was to be that place, the place where democracy happens. So we need to start thinking about that again. I mean, on a simple level, instead of content creation, you know, we will know that something has changed when an editor at MSNBC wakes up and goes, how do I engage a Fox News viewer in a genuine fact-driven debate, a genuine conversation? Um, now, that's not going to happen because their commercial incentives do not lie that way. 
But some sort of third force needs to emerge that will do that. Sort of experiments that we do in ARENA, and I'll tell you more about them, about our methodology uh, next week, um, is, gain, is, is around that. Understanding audiences and polarized groups and thinking how do we construct content that engages people in a common discussion. And not just any discussion, I think for facts to start mattering in that discussion, as we talked about last week, it has to be future orientated discussion. You know? Factuality emerges when you start talking about a pragmatic future. You know? When you move away from you know, identity squabbles to a problem solving mindset. But that's not enough either. At the end of the day, we're actually gonna to have to create this space, especially in the digital manifestation. What is the social media or internet version of what the BBC was meant to be in the 1920s? It's not just about creating content. It's about starting to carve out a, uh, a social media space that is where, where, where public service stuff can happen. So one not based on commercial interests, probably. Probably not one where your kind of uh, data is being sucked for commercial or political gain. Uh, probably not one that's uh, modeled along the emotional logic of likes and shares, which we already know from quite a lot of research. It may not have caused polarization, but it makes it a hell of a lot worse. I mean, the current logic of social media, you know, you go online looking for approval, you know, for likes and shares, which you get by taking a position in your group, which is usually the most extreme group polarization. There is shown that in order to kind of get attention in a group, you take the most extreme position. So to get those likes and shares, you say the thing which is the most extreme in the group, and that pushes the discussion to even more greater extremes. I don't want to blame social media for polarization because I just don't think that's true, but they're certainly not helping. They're certainly playing into it, exploiting it, and probably making it a lot worse. So we need a social media environment that's not based on this sort of emotional logic. Um, and thinking about the design of that is, is something that some of America's and Europe's finest minds are working on. The problem being, again, one of incentives. Um, who's going to fund this? Who's going to support it? How are we going to guarantee its kind of safety and, dare I say, sacredness? All that is to be decided. I will stop now because I think we should have a chat. We'll talk a lot more in terms of the things I've mentioned about what we can do in this situation um, next, next week. I'm gonna get very, very wonkish and very boring and show you, for the first time in our conversation, I'm gonna show you some slides, some graphs, and all those things which are meant to uh, signal authority and wisdom.